interesting things happen after you're in 20 years. James, sooner or later, you're going to be faced with an unexpected test of your integrity. It's just, it comes down to doing the right thing at times. And Love your soldiers. Watch out for your whip. I guess I'm talking to young Jim right now because Jim, these times will face you, whether it's combat or peacetime. It's all a good experience. Enjoy it. <laughs> yes, you'll encounter lots of leaders along your path. The other thing I'd like to say for you is have fun. Welcome to the West Point Society of Northern Nevada's 2021 Founders Night. Coming to you from Reno, Nevada. Hi, this is Bill Conrad from the class of 1980, and I will be your host tonight for this virtual Founders Night for the West Point Society of Northern Nevada. Well, it's been a long year and a half, and uh, this should be the last virtual event for our society. Thank goodness. But for now, let, let me step back and let's go over the itinerary and check out who our speakers are. Our first speaker tonight, an old grad, is Colonel Retired Jerry Gibbs, class of 1952, and son of Colonel Gerald Gibbs, class of 1924. So Jerry, with his 30 years of service, served in two wars to include the Korean War and Vietnam. Jerry had a successful career serving both at West Point and numerous assignments around the world. The youngest grad tonight is 2nd Lieutenant James Hunter from the class of 2021, brand new 2nd Lieutenant. He is Medical Services Corps, will be heading off to Fort Sam for his basic course, basic officer's course, and then is off to flight school for 10 and a half months to become a medevac pilot. And finally, our keynote speaker tonight from the West Point Association of Graduates is Miguel Gutierrez. He is a class of 1980. That's my class. We're classmates. And he was commissioned in field artillery, went over to Europe, then to the National Training Center, you know, out at Fort Irwin, the desert. And after that, he decided to go to the private sector where he worked in career counseling and military transition. And today at the AOG, Miguel helps grads navigate each phase of their post-military career transition. So for our itinerary, after the speakers finish up, we'll sing the alma mater and we'll have an open forum. Now, without further ado, here's our old grad, Colonel Jerry Gibbs, United States Army, retired. Go ahead, Colonel. Okay. In 1932, I was one year old. And even though my dad, who was in the class of 24, made less than $100 a month, we lived in relative luxury. We lived in big quarters on Corregidor, which was a coast artillery post. And since they were authorized to fire only one round per gun per year to remain current, there wasn't much to do. So my dad played polo, tennis, or golf every afternoon. We had an enlisted striker who did the yard work and cleaned our quarters, and a Filipino ama who took me and did the housekeeping and cooking. That's okay, right. that's right. At that time, the Army was looked upon by the country as an unnecessary, wasteful expenditure, since we had recently won the war to end all wars. During 1933, my dad's year group was placed on six months unpaid leave. The Army had run out of money, and nobody cared. My dad sold shoes. I guess it's okay to mention that during this time, prohibition was in force, and my mother made a little extra money making the best bathtub gin in the islands. Then along came World War II, and we were totally unprepared. Suddenly, my dad became part of the greatest generation. As soon as the war was won, we demobilized as fast as possible and immediately forgot everything that had happened. It was at this time we were being told that the Army was not needed anymore and that future wars, if any, could be won by the Navy or the Strategic Air Command. And yet, 730 of us for the Class 52 took the oath on the plane in June 48. Some 65 years later, Thomas Fleming, noted author and writer of several books on West Point, chose the Class of 52 as one of West Point's five most notable. He did this on the basis of the large number who achieved general officer status and mentioned our astronauts, Ed White and Mike Collins, and also Dick Shea, our Medal of Honor recipient. I agree with that, but there's more to it. 
52 had more full kernels than any other class. And that was because most of us stayed until full retirement. The reason the class did not cut and run after two unpopular wars, Korea and Vietnam, was that we understood the necessity of rebuilding the army after the Vietnam disaster. The essential element of the rebuilding was reversing the total loss of integrity that had resulted from the many lies and deceits of Vietnam. One prime example, members of my class, 52, myself included, were part of an Army War College study and paper sent to the Secretary of the Army that many of his senior commanders were corrupt. We stated specifics such as ordering false readiness reports and ordering false body counts, and we named names. Many retirements took place very soon thereafter and the culture changed. There were many other significant actions that we took, but that's really another, another old grad presentation. I would like to think that our legacy is the earned regard that the people of the United States have for our army today. Thank you for listening to the ramblings of an old soldier. My biggest regret is that I can't do it all over again. Thank you, Bill. Jerry, thank you for... Uh coming on being the old grad. Now we'll take you to our youngest grad, and that's James Hunter. So James, I'm going to pin you on here. So James is a brand new second lieutenant class of 2021, and you're coming from New York tonight, right? Yes, sir, I am. Uh, thanks, thanks, Mr. Conrad, for having me on. I'm, I'm honored to be here talking to you as, as your youngest graduate from the United States Military Academy. Um, so this, this past Saturday, I graduated with 995 of my classmates in the class of 21. Um, while I was at West Point, I studied international history and Arabic. Uh, and I commissioned the Medical Service Corps to go off and medical uh, a medevac pilot. Um, but before I even uh, get to that and got to West Point, I have to talk a little bit about my home life. Um, I grew up in a family that really didn't know military service. Uh, my, my grandfather served briefly in the Navy. My great grandfather was one that uh, served in World War II. Uh, but outside of that, on my father's side especially, no one really served. Uh, so this was kind of a new step for my family moving forward when I when I came to West Point. Um, but I think, like like many of you in this in this chat tonight, um, I was brought to West Point by things like a desire to serve my country, um, a desire to to be a part of something that was bigger than myself, um, and to contribute to to my country to to give back. Um, and I think that that's something that's across the board here. Um, so. With all that in mind, I showed up on our day on July 3rd, uh, 2017, to begin my 47-month experience at West Point. Um, now, as, as a recent graduate, about five days removed from that 47-month experience, uh, I've had time to do some reflecting on what it all meant and what it all, what it all is going to mean in the future. Um, and as I look back, West Point is simultaneously like the blink of an eye, uh, and it's also a very long 47 months. Um, but you know, it's not the, the running between classes and the, the occasional, uh, chewing out you get on the plane that that's going to stick in my mind. It's going to be the, the funny moments and the serious moments. So I thought I'd recount a few of those. Um, I remember things like my plebe year when, before we all left for Christmas leave, folks threw printers set on fire out their windows onto the, uh, onto the, onto the apron. I remember when plebes went into central area and threw milk cartons and sang cadence, I remember when there was a food fight in the mess hall, and I remember when my class almost broke the floor of Cullum Hall. Um, and, and I think most importantly, I remember all of the friendships, the lasting friendships that I've made along the way. But I also remember the serious moments. Um, I remember the moments when we were out at Camp Buckner in the middle of the night. You know, it was downpour and it was cold, and, and we, were, we were out there doing tough, realistic training. I remember, unfortunately, the loss of several classmates. Uh, we, had a, we had a couple of those happen during my 47th month experience. Um, and it was tough and it was real and we had to be there for each other. I remember when several of my classmates and, and officer mentors went to Northern France and Belgium and we toured the fields of World War I and we tried to think about what it would mean to be a combat leader. And I remember how my class, the class of 21, led West Point through the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we weren't allowed to leave. There was, there was a lot of restrictions in place and we had to be there for each other. Many, many of my classmates and their families were going through tough times. So it was, a, it was a very real, very serious, but a, but a humbling experience. Through it all, as I look back on this, West Point not only gave me a set of friendships that I'm, I'm confident will last a lifetime, but it gave me a set of skills and my classmates a set of skills that has prepared us for whatever the future holds. 
So on that note, I thought I'd take just a moment to talk about what I and my classmates think that the future has in store. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd, be, I'd be at a loss if I didn't at least acknowledge the fact that I have grown up knowing nothing but a nation at war. 9-11 happened when I was about two years old, and I remember seeing uh, the nightly news of, of soldiers in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, it's all I've known. And, and when I joined West Point, when I came to West Point, that is all I knew. That's what I thought I would be doing. Um, but now in 2021, as, as both of those wars come to a close, it's very clear that we're at a transition point. We're leaving behind the wars of the past two generations and moving into the future. And with that comes a degree of closure, I hope, for, the, for those soldiers that, that, that fought in both of those wars and their families, but also a degree of uncertainty. We don't know what's coming next. With great, comp great power competition on the rise, emerging threats, we simply don't know what's next for our great nation. But the one thing that does remain constant is West Point and the lessons that it teaches its cadets and now second lieutenants. We, the class of 2021, are, are certainly young, and we certainly have a lot to learn. I, I know that. But I do also know that the friendships we've made, the lessons we've learned, and the education we've received, with all of those things, I know that our country is in good hands for the future. So thanks for having me tonight. I'm honored to be here as your, as your youngest graduate, and I, uh, I'm looking forward to being a member of the, the Long Gray Line. Thanks, folks. Oh, very good, James. Very, very good. Everyone's clapping, but I muted everybody. <laughs> So let me go back to gallery and for our keynote speaker from uh, the AOG, Miguel, I got to find, oh, there he is right in the middle. I got to pin you. My transitions need some work. So, hey, classmate. Hey. <laughs> take, take it away. <laughs> right. So uh, first, I want to thank Bill, obviously, my classmate, uh, for roping me into this. No, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm humbled and honored to, to be the speaker tonight. Uh, I hope that someday in the future when the things get back to normal, I can actually come out uh, to one of your events and, and meet everybody because one of the things I like to do in the AOG is actually travel to the societies and talk to you and meet with you in person. So a little background. Um, I came on to the AOG in August of 2000. 18 to become the first director of the newly formed career services organization. So uh, over many surveys with the alumni for the past couple of years, uh, asking what is the greatest need that's lacking uh, among the services that are offered by the Association of Graduates, the number one topic that always hit the top of the survey list was that we did not have any type of formal career services organization to help our graduates as they're transitioning from the military or at any point in their careers, be it already in civilian life. So with that in mind, five graduates got together and said, we need to do something about this. And so they put together some funding and got together with the CEO and the board and said, we want this to happen. Here's some money, make it happen. And so I was brought on as that director it was just me, and I was given a clean slate and said, build it. And that's what I set out to do. And we uh, set up from a blank sheet to from August, had until April. And on April 17th of 2019, went live. That was with a brand new website, functionality, a whole brand new team. I have two team members, Julia Ruddock, class of 07, and Scott Leishman, who is class of 77. So this is three of us that, that make up the entire organization. So what does the Career Services Organization do? I know for many of you, this is long past, you know, you're retired and everything, but it's good to know what uh, uh, the AOG is doing. And I know James, you're gonna be coming to us eventually. <laughs> so it's just a matter of time. Uh, but again, all of you know other grads. Uh, and again, we're working with people who've just got out of 35 years in the military. So we work with everybody. Uh, so the primary function of the association, our mission is, is like I stated earlier, to work with every graduate, regardless of their career stage, be it that cadet who is gonna graduate but not be commissioned due to medical. So we had a few of those this year, all the way up to that Lieutenant General that's retiring or that CEO that's looking for a new company and everything in between. So 
the service is free and it's available to you anytime you want to the extent that you want. We can be a coach for you over an entire period, starting with a blank sheet of paper and helping you create your first resume to if you just need us to help you with uh, an evaluation of an offer letter or how to set up your social media, anything like that. So uh, that's what we're there for. And, and the way we do that is through a series of tools that we have. First off is our website, which is at wpaogcareers.org. It's a standalone site separate from the AOG's website, but you can access it through the AOG's website if need be. It's under services. So anybody can go there, click on get started, and it'll start the whole process on um, getting enrolled into our program. So once you come into our program, we have tools and resources that can be made available to you because our function is not to necessarily find you a job, you know, where you sit home and wait for the phone to ring from one of us and saying, we've got a job for you. We're not a place of agency per se. Our job, as we like to say, is to teach you how to fish as opposed to giving you the fish. So we give you the tools, the resources, the training, the mentorship, the counseling to make you successful, not only now, but in the future. Because on average, our graduates will change jobs a minimum of five times in their career, whether voluntarily or involuntarily, right? So with that, the tools that we provide to them, there are three major tools. One is a platform we call Handshake. And Handshake is the hub, if you can say, of a wheel of resources. And within Handshake, there are three major elements that our grads utilize the most. One is the job board. The job board is unique in that it is restricted to only graduates. The jobs that are posted on there are individually vetted and approved by me and my team. Companies cannot unilaterally post jobs on that job board. We make sure there are jobs that are what our graduates are looking for. So you're not gonna see a $10 an hour, part-time 7-Eleven, midnight to six shift posted on there. You're gonna see professional level uh, positions. We also keep positions on there for individuals who are going to graduate school. We have internships and co-op programs listed on there also. So there's the uniqueness about that job board. The second element is our event section. That is where we communicate to our graduates and tell them about training sessions, virtual job fairs, or in the future, physical job fairs, training classes, and employer uh, webinar sessions where graduates can learn about different companies and what they offer and so forth like that. So there's a lot of good information. And every single one of those sessions is recorded so then it goes into our resource library. And that's the other element. We have the resource library where we keep their, all our training videos, all our uh, videos from our guest speakers, uh, from different uh, series that we do. For instance, we do one, we do a master class session where we bring in a noted expert in a particular topic and they give a talk and we record it and it's in that library. So grads can access all these videos at any time. And that's with Handshake. So beyond Handshake, obviously social media is very important nowadays. So we created our own dedicated career services LinkedIn group, which has been very popular. We just set that up about uh, in March of this year. And already within that group, we've got almost 1400 graduates who have joined that group. So it's restricted to only graduates of the academy. And what's great about it is that we post on there, lots of grads go on there and post openings that they're looking to fill with other graduates. So it's a networking thing utilizing the long gray line so that grads can hire grads. And it's also a forum where grads who are transitioning saying, I'm looking to network, looking for opportunities. They can make that known to grads who are in those hiring positions, who have that ability uh, to be a decision maker. So it's, it's a great interactive forum for our graduates. So what kind of results have this, has this resulted in since we got formed? I'm happy to say that in terms of the number of graduates that we've worked with, at this point, 914 graduates we have worked with. Out of those 914, they range everything from, like I said, that cadet who is not going to get commissioned but will graduate, all the way up to, uh, like I said, those lieutenant generals. I helped one of my classmates when he retired as a lieutenant general, Lieutenant General Gary Cheek. I got him his first job once he left the military. 
on there. So <laughs> he came to us and said, help. <laughs> okay. um, so out of those 914, how many of them have found success in finding a new position? Out of that number, we've had 475 hires in that time period. In 2019, we had 165, that, and that was, a, that was basically only for, uh, you know, three quarters of the year, 165. In 2020, we increased that our first full year to 201 graduates. Now in 2021, we're already at 109, which last year at the same time in 2020, we were only at 68. So we're way ahead of our pace for this year. And again, out of that 914, not necessarily individuals who are leaving in the next three months from the military. I'm working right now uh, with individuals that are on staff at the academy uh, that aren't getting out until 2023. They're starting that far out. So we have individuals way out you know, uh, as part of that group, but they realize the value of getting started early and have started working with us. So who's like the biggest employer? Who hires the most of our graduates? Surprisingly, or maybe not surprisingly, it's Amazon. Amazon is our biggest employer. Uh, we like to say you can't throw a rock at Amazon without hitting a graduate nowadays. And we had them across all levels within the organization. So uh, they really have grabbed on to our graduates and, and, and have actually set up certain programs that if you're a JMO, you go directly into this type of slot. If you're a senior officer, because they got a program like for Lieutenant Colonel Zabuck, they've got a slot you go straight into already. No questions asked. Uh, so it's a great program that they have. Um, some of the key things that we have coming up, for instance, uh, this coming June, June 25th to be exact, we're gonna host our first very own USMA only job fair. It's a tech job fair uh, and we wanted to do that because uh, we get a lot of interest from companies who, who want our graduates. Our graduates are very much in demand. And so we're gonna be hosting uh, that event in, in June. And we're hoping that we'll be uh, looking forward to that being very successful. And one of the key things that we do is we establish partnerships with companies, both formal and informal, because we get unsolicited inquiries from many, many companies that say, how do we get your grads into our company, let's set up a pipeline. And we do that and we do it so that when we have a grad who's interested in an organization and we have a PLC within that company, we bypass HR and we go straight to a hiring manager. We go straight to a decision maker, somebody that can get them around HR and get them to the top of the pile and get them into positions that may not even exist because they want a grad to just come into that organization because they know what they bring uh, to the table in terms of character, leadership, initiative, everything that, you know, West Point emphasizes on our, our graduates, you know, as, as cadets. So we have those partnerships. They've proven very, very valuable. And now we're at the point now where even certain executive search firms have asked to try and connect with us. And we've, we've got some relationships with some boutique search firms. We do a fee split with them because we know how valuable our graduates are, and we work at the levels where it's like the C level. So there's a search firm who might be looking for somebody at a C level or senior VP type or role. So uh, we work with organizations like that, and it really is valuable for those uh, senior officers, those general officers, or somebody who's already been in the civilian world for a long time I'm on there. So, um, that kind of gives us a synopsis of, of what we do uh, in career services. Uh, our phones are always ringing. We're always getting uh, new grads uh, asking to, to work with us. And again, this is all free uh, and this is for the life. And Air Force Academy, Naval Academy, Coast Guard, Merchant Marine have nothing like this. We get phone calls from graduates from those academies asking if we can help them because they have heard about our program and how outstanding it is. And one of the key things that shows how we're seen within the general public is that we picked up two major awards last year for outstanding uh, HR career services team in the entire country. We took a silver and a gold medal uh, in that. 
you know, for those categories. So that was the first for uh, West Point to get that kind of award within any type of career services. So somebody says, we don't believe we're hearing this from Steve Metcalf. <laughs> well, it's being recorded. So it'll be available there on there. So I apologize if you're not hearing that. Um, what's life going on right now? What's what I know James could give, could give probably a little bit more up to date, but within the AOG, uh, we're looking at uh, transitioning into coming back into the office. Right now, we don't have to wear a mask if you go into the office. Um, but in terms of reunions for this coming fall, that decision has not been made by the superintendent yet. Uh, so we're still up in the air waiting for the suit to make some decisions as to the fall reunions and any other fall events. Although we are planning on supporting and coming out to the uh, Air Force Army game in Dallas, Texas in November. So that will be a physical event that we'll be going out to and supporting. And hopefully the reunions themselves this fall will occur. Unfortunately, last year they didn't. So Bill and myself, we missed out on our 40th reunion and we now have to wait to our 45th reunion to get back together again. Uh, so um, that pretty much you know, sums up in terms of what's going on there at, at the AOG with respect to COVID. The majority of the people are still working remotely. I'm in San Antonio, Texas. So James, when you get to Texas and you wanna know where to eat or what to do in San, San Antonio. Antone. Yeah, right, give me a call, you know, bring your golf clubs. <laughs> right? uh, but first, you know, overall, um, I just wanna thank everybody for giving me the, the opportunity uh, to speak with you. Uh, if you got any questions or you got a grad, a young grad, you know, that wants some advice or anything like that uh, with respect to careers, uh, please have them reach out to me and uh, we'll be glad to, to work with them. And uh, any other questions anybody might have, feel free to ask me when we get to the open section. So open section will do questions. That's really good. And so anyway, let me get this back in the gallery. So we're doing good. Um, right now we're going to go to the Alma Mater.
Congratulations. They could bring an unmute. Where's James? Be Navy. I got to find it. Oh, there's James. Oh, go Army, be Navy. So That's right. Unmute. Army, be Navy. So I've got one question from a gal. I mean, James. Was it Mahan Hall you guys broke? Uh, it was Cullum Hall. Oh, Cullum. I mean, it's Cullum Hall. Cullum, Cullum Hall. What did you guys do? Yeah, it was, uh, it was uh, the plebe Halloween dance. I don't know if that was a, uh, back, in, but back in most of your times, but basically they had a, a dance when we were all plebes. Um, and uh, at one point, the, the man doing the music kind of grabbed a microphone and he, he shouted all of us. He said, hey, go to the sides of the room. The floor is caving in. Um, and we all ran to the sides of the ran to the sides of Cullum Hall, and there was, there was, sure enough, there were cracks in the floor. So they evacuated us out to central area, and then uh, I don't know really what happened, but all of a sudden there was a green smoke grenade out there, and I said I gotta go before we get here. So, wow. So anyway, Cullum Hall is the one you guys busted. Yep. How dare you busted that, Lieutenant? <laughs> I got laid on that floor one night. <laughs> <laughs> At my wedding reception there. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Was it yours? I can't remember. <laughs> Neither can I. <laughs> All I know is I used to sleep there betw between classes. In the, in the chair, I go, sleep. It was a great place to sleep. <laughs> I got a question for Miguel. Yes, sir. Uh, a question and a comment. One, I still have sort of a negative view to anybody, anything that might induce, you've heard this before, of course, induce graduates to leave the service, which I think your organization does a splendid job of doing. And it just seems wrong to me. Well, actually, uh, two thirds of the living graduates are out of the military before, you know, before we even came into existence. Uh, so the number of graduates that are in civilian life already greatly exceeds those who are in the military. So there's a huge demographic pool that we support, uh, you know, that are already in civilian life itself. Um, you know, we don't solicit anybody while they're on active duty or anything like that. So, um, you know, we're not out there trying to encourage anybody to leave. And in fact, you know, Sometimes we've actually told some individuals to just, it would, really would be better if they actually stayed in active duty service. So um, they come to us and sometimes they ask, you know, should I get out? This is what I want to do. Maybe I should stay in. And, you know, sometimes we say, you know what, in your case, you'd be better yeah, off made, staying in. That made my point. I do have a question. I found the hardest part about trying to get into the civilian job market, figuring out a compensation. How much I should ask for? How much is that? You never see. You never mention that in your presentation. Yeah. Well, actually, we keep pretty detailed metrics on everything, and one of those is uh, every time we help somebody, you know, find a position, we send them a survey, and then we get uh, what their comps are, both bonuses, equity, whatever it might be, and we keep all that those those records so that. When somebody says, hey, I'm, I'm getting out, what kind of compensation can I expect if I go into this kind of field in this part of the country? We have the data there to tell them, this is what you can expect. You know, Sometimes we have to bring some people back into reality uh, that what they wanna go into, you know, you're not gonna make $200,000 to start. You're gonna be maybe $85,000 to start. Uh, so uh, by having the actual data, it, it lends credence to the advice we're giving to people. And every time we help somebody get in, that's another data point that goes into our metrics. So we have uh, also uh, about 500 graduates who have volunteered to be what we call industry mentors. So we can connect you with somebody within the industry and they'll give you the straight poop too about what your you know, expectations can be uh, with respect to compensation. And, and again, that could be for that JMO just getting out or that lieutenant colonel or colonel that's getting out and they have no idea, you know, what their value is. And we can give them a pretty good estimate of what their value is based on all the data points that we have already. So that's the biggest question, yeah, that they always ask us, how much am I worth? And uh, fortunately, we have that data. Okay, thank you. So you have to unmute everyone's, most everyone's muted. I muted them uh, during the presentation. So if you have any questions you want to mute, just hit the bottom down below.
Bill. Yeah. Hey, Jack, Bill, yeah. Jack Logan here. I'd like Go ahead, to Jack. Go. Go ahead, Hello. Jack. Okay. Um, the Long Gray Line lost a real soldier in uh, May of 20 of uh, this year when Major General retired John Hemphill uh, passed away. Uh, John was my uh, brigade commander in Vietnam when I had an infantry battalion, and he was a great soldier. He had earned the Distinguished Service Cross in Korea as a young lieutenant, the class of 1951. Uh, he had two silver stars, three bronze stars, and three purple hearts. Um, but more importantly, I think, was his contribution to the community of Steelacom, Washington, Indian name, obviously, at, <clears throat> in which he was Citizen of the Year in, I think, 1998, somewhere around there. But the tribute to, that he left in place is just outside the main entrance of Joint Base Lewis McCord. And if you are fortunate enough to be in that area and go through that gate, you will, before you do, you will see a small memorial park, which honors the Lewis and Clark expedition, but more importantly, honors Sergeant Ordway and his dog. It's probably the only monument in the United States in which an enlisted soldier is featured. And John collected by hard work and a lot of effort in publicity, more than $3 million to construct those statues, those monuments to Lewis and Clark and Sergeant Ordway and their dog. So I, I would like us all to remember not only all these wonderful young men who graduate from our alma mater and go on to great and, and joyous things, but also people like John Hempel class of 1951, who has passed away, but left his presence, left his presence and his fondness for soldiers in a very remarkable way. So thanks for listening. I love John as a soldier, as a man, and um, we're still in touch with his widow Peggy and their five daughters. Um, so thanks for listening. Very good. <laughs> I'll be at Lu I'll be at Lewis McCord this summer. My daughter's got CTLT up there, so we're going to try to go up and visit and do a little trip. Have to look. Gonna, he's going to he's going to Joint Base Lewis. You know, McCord. Jack. It's interesting yeah. that you brought this, Steve. It's interesting you brought that up because um, a classmate of mine from high school, a fellow named Tony Forsythe who went to Whitman College for two years and then went on to West Point. So he's two years behind me, graduated in 71. But he lived right there in a condo complex in Steelington and knew John. Uh, the whole community admired him. And, and he mentioned that to me last week. Oh, uh, What a remarkable guy he was. And he wished he had known him better and this and that and the other. But uh, the man had quite a reputation in the whole Seattle Tacoma region, uh, very deservedly so. Thank you, Steve. Well, he got distinguished service crossed um, in Korea. Uh, first Correct. major medal, he uh, was wounded in both legs as leading a charge to retake a hill. Yep. Right on. Wow. Heck of a citation. I lost him as a brigade commander when he was wounded again in the right thigh uh, by an AK-47, uh, which um, made a lucky hit on John's helicopter. Yep, pretty amazing. 
Well, anyway, so do we have any, any other questions of anybody? Uh, we'll, we'll record this and edit it a bit. I have a comment. I have a good Steve again, and I know I talk too much. Uh, anybody else can shut me down. I'll take it well. But to the younger graduate, you know, you guys come out of there and you're full of piss and vinegar. Uh, and yeah, you've had your kind of experiences and you'll hear about them at reunions for years to come. They're cherished. You don't know what the nation will bring for you. But whatever you perceive right now about your future, believe me, it will be different. Mm -hmm. I'm very unhappy, and I'm preaching now, but I'm very unhappy that we're in an era when we accept a general officer getting up on Hillary Clinton's campaign or Donald Trump's campaign and aligning with parties and speaking publicly about it. That's a court martial offense if they were to face it. Our job, no matter how we feel personally, is to be absolutely apolitical and serve the nation. You're at the beginning of your little odyssey, and I regret to say it's going to be a very rugged next 15 years. So keep your powder dry and remember your job is to command soldiers who might be left, might be right, might be of any race, any color, and command them well. I resign. Yes, sir. Couldn't agree more. Bill, I got a comment about Founders Day in general. Can you hear me? Yeah, loud and clear. Uh, everybody knows that we've been having trouble the last few years getting people coming to Founders Day, and it was, especially with the younger classes. And for a while now, we said, what's wrong with the younger classes? But I noticed a statistic that you actually, Bill Conrad, furnished us not recently about contributions to the All-American Challenge. And the younger classes were doing far, far better than the older classes. So using the measure of loyalty to Judiana country and going to Founders Day is specious. So, which takes me right back. I still don't know what to do about Founders Day. Well, any comments out there? How, we, how would you improve Founders Day? Yes. Anybody out there? I know I didn't get to go to a Founders Day for a long time while I was on active duty. In fact, when I was in Bagram, they had a Founders Day and I couldn't find the darn thing. Or as in Afghanistan. And, uh, Jack has something to say about Founders Day. Go, Go ahead, Jack. Yeah, um, not exactly about Founders Day. I would just like to say I think Ann Davis is doing a great job of collecting West Point candidates, as well as I'm sure she helps other service academy uh, people. But um, it seems like she's very responsive. You are in and very helpful when we have someone we think um, should go to West Point and will do well there. So thank you, Ann, for all your hard work, your good work. Thanks so much, Jack. And, and I really do enjoy when I get those referrals from all of you out there, um, when you come across those young candidates that you think are, are uh, good ones to push forward. And so keep on doing that. I'm always happy to help. Jack, you're uh, you're muted. Yeah, I think you muted it. We have um, a lady um, who was the student body president at um, Damani at Damani Ranch High School, and last year she went to the prep school. Uh, she's a black female. Yeah, uh, Brianna Bolton. Brianna yeah. Bolton. Her dad's. Um, Retired colonel uh, in the Army National Guard of Nevada. And uh, we stay in touch with Brianna. And I, I have a feeling that at the least she'll be a battalion commander, if not the first captain, in 20... 2025. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Great lady. And, she is. She, uh, did, um, she did get her offer. And she has accepted it. So she'll, she'll be starting our day 
uh, in in June, and um, so that's all good news for her. Yeah. Yes. When is our day? It oh, I believe it's somewhere around twenty four, twenty five, twenty six June. No, yes, it is three days. It, it is. It's they're coming in over day. three days because of the whole pandemic thing. So. No. Yeah. We will see her this summer when she's home. And, and uh, people like Brianna, I think, keep my faith in the quality of the Corps of Cadets. She's a great yeah. lady, and uh, I know that she is just one of very many that are going to our alma mater. Thank you. Yeah. And she also told me she wants to be on the boxing team. <laughs> Oh, Jesus. <laughs> Some about that here is fun. <laughs> that doesn't boxing. surprise us. Yeah. I, think our job Man. Is to, I think our job is to facilitate and encourage outstanding young men and women in the greater Reno area. Mm -hmm. And uh, whenever we find one that we think um, – can qualify and uh, go on and serve our country as we have done, um, we are obliged to help them every way we can. And uh, Brianna is such a, um, a fine lady that we are um, happy to have helped her. Um, her dad says, you know, you guys are great mentors. That's high praise. Thank you. You know, so, um, go ahead. At the risk again of speaking too much, Bill, go ahead. I wonder if any of our fellow graduates have any kind of considerations about the remarkable paradigm we're going through right now. COVID slowed us down and put a cork in things for a while. While we looked at where we are, what our challenges are, what we're facing with a Chinese threat, with a Russian threat, the nuclear threat. Does anybody want to have a general BS session to just share their thoughts about that? And I'm throwing it out to the group. It, it's scary. I'd say it's really scary. It's always scary. I don't think when you're young, when you're a young second lieutenant, I don't think you realize how scary it really is. I know um, in 2009, I was trail in Afghanistan. Um, I, we lost nine guys two days before we left. And when I got back on, on the plane three days later at Bagram coming in from the field, I saw three second lieutenants in November, four second lieutenants, three or more West Point grad, grads class of 09, I think it's 09. They had finished their OCS, their infantry basic and ranger school, and they're already over there before Christmas. So the second lieutenants took a beating up in the Korengal, and it's a tough world. But now with the Chinese, um, it's scary. It's scary. So James, you, you've got, you'll earn your money as a medevac pilot. I've seen those guys yeah. go in in Afghanistan. Yeah. So anyway, it's scary. Others of a more strategic concept thoughts. Well, I guess not. <laughs> well, I don't know. It's, it's just scary. The world is, I think the older you get, you realize when you're young, I think when you're deployed, you don't realize how dangerous it really is. Now, now, Jerry, you were in Vietnam and Korea. Yeah. And uh, when you were there, did you realize how dangerous it was? Yeah, I, I've been mulling over Steve's point, if you'll allow me to go back there. I, I was still thinking when he looked for an answer. You know, I'm not nearly so worried as worried about the external threat as I am the internal threat. I think we're starting to lose our way in national purpose. And uh, once we lose that, we're finished. Question is, what is that national purpose? Do you want to try to articulate it? Well, you see, if I, if I did that, I'm, the national purpose that is being perceived right now or presented right now to me is phony. It has to do with woke. It has to do with uh, rights, and I'm trying to choose my words carefully, but it does has nothing to do with personal or group responsibility. Good point. 
You know something, though? Um, all of us have had diverse careers. I think I heard another peep. I'd rather let someone else speak. Go ahead. James, what's your class think? What do you think coming up? I mean, you're brand new second lieutenant. What, what's your feelings? Yeah, I think um, I'll tell you, my, my class is certainly aware uh, of, of the the challenges that, that I think uh, Mr. McLaugh that, that you've brought off. Um, you know, there's, there's a class that we have now called MX 400 officership. Um, and I was fortunate enough to be in a class with the uh, Lieutenant Colonel and, and actually the commandant who sat into my class. Um, and he, he certainly as a general officer shared his opinions on that. And I think uh, we, we always emphasize that, you know, our loyalties to the constitution that we are politically aware, but not politically involved. Um, and, and so I think, with that in mind, having that class right before graduation, um, we, we certainly have the mindset going into going into our, our starting our career as a second lieutenant. Um, it's just a matter of, of keeping those ideas at, at the heart of what we do in the heart of our service, uh, not letting you know um, other opinions kind of kind of sway us towards uh, being at the You know that leads well, me in. Sure. If, if ever everyone go around, I think it'd be an interesting thing. What would looking back, what would your advice be to class of 2021 if you give one piece of advice? And there's a lot of advice you could give. There's a lot of good things you could do. I think, Steve, your advice of being neutral, and that's your obligation, of being neutral politically, um, not being a Republican or a Democrat. Uh, some great leaders that came out, like Eisenhower never declared what his what he was. You, you, you serve the nation, you serve the Constitution. So I think that was really good advice for her basic foundation. That's my advice. Just serve your country, your duty. Um, one thing I would say, if you stay in um, and you stay into 20, stay in 22 years. Interesting things happen after you're in 20 years. At least 22 years. Because <laughs> opportunities open up. Well, you know, my, my thought, based on what happened in, in my years, is James... Sooner or later, you're going to be faced with an unexpected test of your integrity. Choose wisely. Yeah. Yes. I would agree with that. I mean, Bill, you know, when we were in, you know, it wasn't too long after Vietnam and everything. The Army was in transition. And I went to Germany and drugs and alcohol were the biggest issues in Germany at the time. And, you know, coming across troops that were smoking pot, had pot in their rooms, but they were smart on knowing how to put it in common areas so you couldn't charge anybody. Uh, and just, you know, you're gonna, you're eventually gonna face a situation, James, where it's like, you know, what uh, they just said that it's gonna be a moral dilemma that you're gonna be faced. Uh, I ended up having to get my platoon sergeant fired and reduced in rank wow. because of some issues. And here I am as a lieutenant and this guy's got years on me, you know, how do I handle that? You know, but uh, it's just, it comes down to doing the right thing at times. And you just gotta, you know, dig inside and, and, and make that decision, you know, yourself. And I'm, I'm sure everybody here has probably run into something like that, especially the individuals who served in combat. Uh, you know, I never served in combat. It was just the Cold War. Bill did combat, though, because he stayed in. But uh, I can only imagine some of the moral conflicts um, all you guys, uh, you know, faced at one time or another in, in, during those combat tours. Larry, what's your advice? We'll go to Jack, Chuck, and Ann, and Bill. We'll finish up. Larry, you got to unmute yourself. Uh, Jack is ready to give advice. Jack, Let's what's your advice? And we'll go to Larry. My advice is this. Um, love your soldiers. Find out all you can about them, and their family, their ambitions, their disappointments. And taking care of that platoon of yours that you will be honored to stand in front of is your main keeping. But also, we have to remember the mission comes first. 
And sometimes the accomplishment of the mission is going to cost you the lives and possible wounding of your soul. But that's your job, your leader, to your West Point. And I would say in summary, love your soldiers, respect them, but remember that accomplishment of the mission comes from. Touche, right. Jack. Touche. Very good. Well, just to back to Miguel. This is Barbara. Back to Miguel. The problem now, I would think, would be with the legality of drugs in most of the states of one kind or another. And how how is that going to be handled in the military? You can have it off base, but you can't have it on. And I know mm. that got to be a problem. It, it's still federally against the law, so it can't. it's against USMJ. They can't do drugs off base anywhere. Well, yeah, but before you drive on base. No, they can't do drugs. No. If you're in the military, you, you can't. You can't do it at all. It's UCMJ, same thing. Yeah. Whether you're on base or off base, it, it still applies. Yep. UCMJ. Yeah. UCMJ. So if we ever federalize marijuana, that's where it would change. Larry, what's what's your advice to James in his class? Who do you have? That you. Class? Larry, what's your uh, advice? For, for the him, well, you kind of watch out who you're with. I came across a guy at Squadron Officer School. That's where the Air Force sent all of the um, new captains. And there was a guy there that was very dishonest when I called him on it one time. And lo and behold, uh, two assignments before I retired, he became my squadron commander. And he was such a bad guy, he ruined every officer's career in that squadron. He took a guy that was the outstanding junior civil engineering officer in SAC and got it where he was denied uh, staying on active duty. So you got to watch out for those guys. So what can you do? It sounds like if you're assigned to somebody like that, what do you do? Well. I don't know that you'd have to see what the flavor is on the base and uh, go into the uh, IG on it. And it's IG. something I've thought about since that is there ought to be a way for the services to monitor the performance reports of uh, the commanders and that of their junior officers and see what they do because I'll bet you that guy ruined everybody everywhere he went. So Chuck, you're next and then Ann and then Bill and we'll finish up for the night. Yeah, hey, just a minute, though. Just, uh, excuse me, Chuck, just a minute. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, Larry, you know your point, Larry. I, it's funny. In my experience, Larry, I've seen that happen four or five times. Never to me, but to other great officers that fell into a weak chain and somehow a link was really badly broken and they stood up for the right and they it cost them and they left. Now, there, most of them went on to make a very successful life. But I guess I'm talking to young Jim right now because, Jim, these times will face you, whether it's combat or peacetime. But I promise you that no matter where you are, it's the guy in the mirror that you've got to face every day. And the basic credo of duty on our country uh, will stand by you, whether you're a civilian or military. So when the challenge comes, be adroit, be graceful, be encouraging, try to guide your boss in the right direction. Try to explain why it might be better. But don't sacrifice yourself for it. Let me follow up something I tell my son, Brian. Tell him, uh, we, you talk a lot. He's a lieutenant commander right now. And I just tell him you can only fall on your saber once. So hold that, hold your, hold your powder. Until it's really Actually, important. what I meant was don't sacrifice your honor. Well, well I believe in don't sacrifice your honor, too, but realize right? you can only fall on your saber once. Yeah, well, that's true. But that's the only, it's the only honor you have. 
Um, don't buckle, in other words. Be gracious, try to sidestep, but, but don't buckle. Yes, sir. You, you know, the military, the Army, have trust in the chain of command and, and above your chain of command. Go up through your chain of command if you had to. I went, to, I went two steps above the chain of command when I was in the 160th to a general. And I'm happy I did that. So my commander was good. He was court-martialed, my battalion commander. And uh, it was a tough time. My wife can attest to that. <laughs> but you will have tough times. I'm sure that Jerry's had tough times, that we've all had tough times. So, and, and, I stole the mic. Pass it on. Pass it on. So anyway, here we go. Chuck, it's your turn. Oh, Ann and then Bill. I always have stories. <laughs> and I was thinking about my whole career and I spent 20 years in, retired, and done essentially the same thing. But I enjoyed it. Everything was an opportunity, a learning experience. I was at Fort Ord in 72 as a company commander. During demonstration and Jane Fonda and rocks thrown at me and all this other stuff. But it was all good experience. My wife... At 27 years in the army, I was an army nurse, and every time she came in, I always say, oh, it's good experience. Every opportunity <laughs> is good experience. I got a daughter put in the reserves when she was 17. She's now on track to two stars, and we tell her it's all good experience. Enjoy it. <laughs> that's, that's Thank good. you. So next we've got Anne. There we go. Um, I, what I would say is you'll encounter lots of leaders along your path. And some of them are good and some of them are bad. Learn both kinds of lessons and decide which way you want to go. Yes, ma'am. Will do. Very good. And Bill, you get to finish up tonight. Thank you. Uh, James, uh, I'd like to say... You know, one thing you can do as a young officer, if you really want to become a better officer, is listen to the guidance you get from your attendant NCOs. Those guys can help you be the best officer you will ever be. Listen to them. They've got the experience and you will learn mightily from them and they will keep you out of a lot of, a lot of bad stuff if it's likely to happen. The other thing I'd like to say for you is have fun. I don't care what you're doing and where you are, and what your assignments are and how tough they are. You'll still be able to have fun and do it. You're a young man. Enjoy your time. You will learn a lot. You'll be grateful for what you've learned and it will stay with you all your life. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. for. Uh... I want to thank, thank you everybody. so much for all your I want to thank, thank everybody, you. especially James. Thank you. Jerry, Jerry, thank you. And Miguel and everyone who showed up was a blast to, to listen. Like I said, you gonna, Miami? James, we'll, we'll have a good Founders Day next year in face to face. Yeah, yeah <laughs> absolutely. Looking forward to it. Thank you. you know, one thing I'd like to say before we leave Larry, Larry has done such an incredible job through the year. Quarter in, quarter out. Those of us that have run West Point societies know that it's relentless and it never ends. Everybody's focused on other things. Larry, uh, thanks for your good work here uh, with our society in Reno. Yeah. Thank you, Steve. You see, it's from there. Amazing, Larry. I, you know, I've been I've been looking at all the paperwork that Larry has and what he's done. It's incredible. You're pretty good on the computer, Larry, in design. Uh oh, here she comes. <laughs> It's incredible. Well, thank you again, everybody, and uh, look forward to seeing you. Hey, one last thing. June 6, 3108 Sweet Clover Street, Reno, Nevada. We're going to have all the cadets and midshipmen. We did it last year. It was a lot of fun. We're going to hand out signs, have a little dessert. It'll be at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. So everyone's welcome. Also, I'd encourage you to come to the uh, Christmas dinner with the cadets and midshipmen. It's a lot of fun to meet those. And I think it's good to see the support from all academies of our current Cadets and midshipmen. So thank you. I'm going to end that. So good night. Thank you, Miguel. Thanks, everybody. Good night.
Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you. We'll see you in San Antonio soon. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Thanks, sir. Miguel, Miguel, you got to take him out now. Oh, yeah. I know where to take him to eat, get some real Mexican food. Oh, yeah. Oh, you know what? I oh, love that. Mexican he didn't food. take Spanish because this place, they only speak Spanish in the restaurant. And the menu's the same way, too. So I've got it covered. <laughs> oh, that's so good. Oh, I love it. San Antonio. <laughs> San Antonio. Yeah, it is San Antonio. Okay. Bye. All right. See you guys. Enjoy meeting everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye bye. Thanks, sir. Take care. Good luck, James. Thank you, yeah. ma'am. Good luck, James. Thank you, James, too. Thank you for taking it all. <laughs> <laughs> and Jerry, that's good. Thank you. Good Jerry, Thank you should have confidence in the core. Look at that. How many years difference is there? Let's see, 52 good. to, wow, 69 Sun years. Bill. Yeah. Thank you very much for taking this on, Bill. Yeah, it was yeah. a lot of fun. I just need to get better at uh, Zoom. <laughs> Zooming. Zooming. I hope you'll never have to do it again. So, <laughs> I am so tired of Zoom. <laughs> but it works. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. I'm going to hang up. Great job. Okay. Take care. Thank you. We're the Army and proud of our name. We're the Army and proudly proclaim. Way. Count off and pay the solid